Hey everybody, it's PJ from Wisconsin Air Gunners. It is an absolutely gorgeous day here in Central Florida, and I have the opportunity to bring to you a box to bench video on the Diana XR200 in 22 caliber. I've already done a box to bench and then a hunting follow up on the 30 cal version. Uh, that was with the green, uh, not laminate, but the synthetic stock. This is their premium woodstock version with a carbon fiber shrouded barrel, and I've got high hopes in the accuracy department. I'd like to thank Diana and their North American distributor, Blue Line, for getting this rifle to me so I can do this review for all of you. So stay tuned. All right. We are ready to open this box and uh, let's just take a look and see what's inside. through some important papers. All right, here is the business right here. This is what we're wanting to see. Nice hard case. Okay, so we got the rifle encased in plastic <laughs> with some very important German on it. I've got a spacer for the single shot tray, looks like. Uh, some Allen keys. Um, Diana's typically multilingual, lots of detail. Uh, manuals. Oh yes, so this is the two-shot loader. Uh, it's basically a shuttlecock thing that goes back and forth like that. Um, love that setup. Got a, it's like a 12-shot rotary magazine. Um, the paperwork that says it's a USA only export product and then the rifle itself beautiful see there is a prominent attention before you fill the empty cylinder make sure the muzzles point a safe direction make sure the safety is in fire pull the trigger uh, cock the hammer so before you fill this for the first time you need to uh, basically dry fire it and make sure the hammer is cocked otherwise you have a situation where um, air will just rush through the valving. Very common on a lot of PCPs if you're not familiar with that. Um, so that's well labeled. All right, let's take a look at some features. So on the back, we have a ventilated rubber butt pad, nice and grippy on the back. You've got a swivel sling stud right here. This cheek piece does go up. You've got nice stippling on the grip there. That feels really nice. I am um, a pistol grip shooter. I, I, I like that better. Um, I also like a thumb hole, um, but I will not complain about this. Um, this is nice. Side lever, 
cocking. Okay, fire, pull the trigger. And there's the cocking, okay. So you do have to go through that, uh, that thing first, so. That is a very nice and light trigger. That's gonna be great. We'll get a, we'll get a measurement for you on that. Um, there is a little bit of grit at the end of that cocking cycle. We'll have to see if that smooths out a little bit. Um, this is ambidextrous, so you can swap it from right to left and left to right. The safety is on the opposite side, um, and that can be switched as well. It does have a dry fire like trainer mode um, and basically you put it on safe after you fired you put it on safe and then back and it doesn't go all the way back to fire and then you cock and you actually can practice just your trigger pull which is a nice touch not something everybody would use but a nice touch um, we've got the breech here, that's where the magazine or that shuttle go. Um, you have your regulator pressure gauge here. You have, um, actually before we go down front, there's the screw right here and its companion right there. Um, and that is, I. About 99% sure a transfer port adjustment and I think the way it works is you um, unscrew the left side let me check my notes because I have some notes on this so uh, my friend Steve over at the air gun exploration and advancement channel AEAC um, is also doing some work on one of these and he's actually had a little play around in the world of adjusting the transfer port setting uh, so thanks to Steve for sharing his knowledge with me, as he does uh, really to all of us. I, I Like weird giving a shout out to Steve at AEAC because just about everybody in the air gun field knows who he is. Um, but if you haven't checked his channel out, you, you really should. There's a lot of good information there. But to adjust the transfer port, you're going to back this screw out on the right hand side. That allows you to remove this screw on the left, and then there's a little, I think it's a 1.5 Allen uh, millimeter Allen key in there, and you go clockwise to close it to bring down the velocity, and you go counterclockwise to open it or raise the velocity. Um, then you put this one on, and then you put this one on, and that locks it all together. So if out of the box your gun is not shooting the velocity you want it to shoot, this is going to be super important to you. Um, as you move forward, really, for a traditional rifle stock, this really is a nice, this has a nice feel to it. I, I like, I like how this feels. Um, so we have a carbon fiber shrouded barrel. You have an air cylinder here and your foster fill port, no probes, which is nice. Your foster fill probe is right there under this, I will say, weighty um, cap. So don't lose the cap. And then you have this adjustable air gauge. I can do this now and move it because there's no air in the gun, but if I was a left-handed shooter, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not good at it. I put this here and now I can see the air gauge down my line of sight. For me as a right-handed shooter, and that's the way this gun came set up, see how it's on that side. And if I'm on target, I can see my air gauge right there. It does have the typical warning on the air tube. Um, it is in 
MPA, so it's a 25 MPA max pressure fill. Um, and it actually gives you the date that that vessel was manufactured. So this one was manufactured in June of 2023. Um, so good information there. On the bottom, that it just really is a really nice feeling stock. Um, on the bottom, you have a rail right here. And this is actually uh, M-Lock compatible. So I'm going to get a, a Picatinny um, mount there so I can mount a bipod to do a little shooting. And one other thing of note, and that is that your rails are dovetail. So you either need a set of dovetail rings, if like me, you regularly shoot Picatinny, or you need Picatinny rings, um, but you'll need one of those uh, UTG makes them. Basically it fits in a Picatinny and makes those jaws bite dovetail. So uh, you'll, need, you'll need one or the other of those, just depending on your circumstances and what kind of equipment you're normally shooting. So it's going to take me a little bit to get this rifle set up to go to the bench. So I'm going to do that, and when I come back, we'll be on the bench. Um, we will get you some chronograph numbers. We will get you a trigger pull weight, and then we'll shoot some groups. So stay tuned. So we'll put some air in the rifle. Um, I did, first of all, I did a conversion. So the tank says it's... 25 MPA, just something Pascals or something like that. Um, I did I did do the conversion just to make sure I was clear. Um, what that means is 250 bar is the max fill pressure on the tank. The manual says fill the gun to 200 bar. So I'll be running fills on this rifle based on what the manual says. Because my guess is what's on the tank itself um, is like an engineering standard. That's what the vessel is set for. But everything else within the gun is built for 200 bar. So I'm going to recommend, based on what's in the manual, a 200 bar fill. Foster fitting sets up real nice. So we've got our 200 bar fill and almost ready to shoot. Welcome to the bench. So what's happened since we last talked? Um, I have filled the gun a half dozen times. Um, I have shot it across the chronograph. I want to talk about that. Um, but I also did a little bit of discovery with the transfer port adjustment. And I want the opportunity to talk you through what I learned there. So like I said before, I'd been uh, in contact with Steve Shally uh, of AEAC. And he walked through kind of the process. So you have two screws, one on either side. And then you have this little grub screw with a little point on the end. And that moves back and forth, opening and closing the transfer port. Now, I don't exactly, I don't have it figured out. Uh, it's not like a transfer port that I've seen in the past. So I'm not exactly sure how it works. I'm just going to call it German engineering and be good with it. But um, I did play with it quite a bit. And I have the gun shooting at about 885 feet per second. Which with the JSB 
uh, 18 grain pellets should be a pretty accurate spot. And while I was doing that shooting um, and running shot strings, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, I was shooting groups down range and I could do that because I was using the FX uh, True Ballistics chronograph. So it's not hanging on the barrel really easy to, uh, to get your data as well as tune the gun, um, but allow you also to see what kind of accuracy you're printing down range. So I have a target out at 30 yards and basically every magazine size shot, a uh, group I shot probably could be covered with a quarter. Um, and that really wasn't, you know, what I would consider concentrating on trying to shoot a you know, really, really tight group. So, um, again, that procedure is you take the screw on the right hand side, back it out, and then you take the screw on the left hand side, back it out. You don't need to back them out all the way. And then you take the supplied 1.5 millimeter Allen screw or Allen key, Allen wrench, let's call it an Allen wrench. Um, you slide that through the hole on the left side of the gun and you turn it clockwise to bring down the speed and counterclockwise to bring the speed up. Um, I found that I had at least 40 feet per second of adjustment there. Uh, there may be more, but that's what I played with uh, to get the gun shooting where I wanted it. Um, it did take some fiddling around making first small adjustments, then bigger adjustments, then back to small adjustments um, to get to where I wanted. And just to give you an idea of the kinds of numbers that I was seeing, um, and I will put this up on the screen for you. Um, so this is um, in a, I was doing a three magazine um, run to kind of see what, how many shots per fill can you expect. Um, the first magazine, the high was 899, um, the low was 891 with an average <coughs> of 895, so an 8 feet per second spread, which is pretty solid, and a 2.6 standard deviation. Without refilling, then I refilled the magazine, second, um, second magazine, high was 905, low was 894, an average of 898, uh, an 11 feet per second spread, and a 3.4 standard deviation. Um, overall, if you take those highs and lows, you go from 905 to 891, so that's about 14, um, and you have an average about 896, 897. I put a third magazine in, um, I got two shots out of that magazine that I would say were, were you know, consistent with that original group. And then I hit the regulator and started dropping off uh, right away. So by the time I was done with that magazine, the third magazine, I think the Corona was at like 836. So it drops off pretty steeply. So I would expect to get two magazines out of this gun. Um, it's a 200 bar fill. And, um, you know, it's a tube style magazine, so um, it's not exactly what you're going to get out of a carbon fiber bottle. Um, so here's the, here's the last, um, here's the last magazine. Again, not, uh, not anything, I, honestly, the first six shots were in the same hole at 30 yards. So you could, you could shoot the first six shots out of that magazine, um, and I would say by the 12th shot, I was probably dropping an inch at 30 yards. So if you were close, yeah, you could use some of those shots. But I don't know how often you want to shoot off the regulator. I'm going to call it two magazines per fill um, on this rifle. So I did um, play a little bit more with that um, transfer port adjustment. And I got to where I got a one magazine spread of six feet per second and a standard deviation of 1.9 and that's where I locked everything in so it may be worth your time to um, tune and then fine-tune that transfer port setting to get to exactly where you want to be um, for your use case there's overhead here that I think you could definitely shoot JSB redesigns um, I think if you were putting Hades in here 
Um, I'm not sure how much more I could tune this down. Um, those are going to be moving pretty hot. Now I've, I've shot with good luck or good success. JSB Hades up to maybe 9, 10-ish. Um, so I think you'd be okay uh, with those in this gun. Uh, but on a box to bench, that's not what I'm, uh, not what I'm testing out. So again, right now, what you're going to see, the groups I'm going to shoot uh, in just a few minutes here, were um, two magazines per fill. And we're seeing high of 888, low of 882, average 885 spread of six standard deviation of 1.9 so um, pretty happy with it so far um, I did notice as I was uh, working with the air gun that the cocking stroke um, has what I would consider kind of a couple of distinct um, I don't know stages maybe um, when you first pull it back it is buttery smooth until about 90 degrees to the gun. Um, then you pull it back against some spring tension and you will hear the magazine rotate. But then there is a final uh, pull that you have to do um, to actually cock the rifle. Um, it's a little bit, uh, kind of feels glitchy, um, not super smooth. Um, I'm hoping it will smooth out a little bit over time, but that remains to be seen. What I'm going to do now is go get my trigger scale, and we're going to give you an out-of-the-box trigger weight, so stand by. The rifle is cocked. The trigger scale is ready. Fourteen point four ounces. Fourteen point five ounces. Fifteen ounces. So <laughs> I don't need a calculator to calculate that average. The average is 14.6 ounces. So just a little bit under a pound. Um, there is a noticeable take up to the second stage. So you pull through the first stage to the second stage. I would say the wall's not super sharp, but it's definitely there. And then you pull right through. Um, definitely a nice hunting trigger, and uh, I think it's going to do well for us out in the field. Let's talk about loading one of these magazines in case you're not familiar with this style. Um, first, you rotate it counterclockwise until it comes to a stop. Then there's a hole on the back side of the magazine and you drop a pellet in skirt first. Um, that will pin the magazine so the cassette stays in place and you can rotate the clear cover and drop the rest of the pellets in head first. So it's a pretty tried and true style of magazine. Uh, most of us are fairly familiar with it. I believe the rifle ships with one. It's always nice when they throw in an extra, but I uh, believe this just ships with one. You do, however, also get the shuttle loader, um, which, again, I really like, especially on the 30 caliber version. Um, that shuttle load back and forth system you just put a pellet in there put a pellet in there then you slide it in shoot that one push it slide it over put another pellet in shoot this one slide it back now that pellet's ready to go put another pellet in there shoot this one 
you just go back and forth all day long if you want. Um, it's a nice system and the, the stop points on it are magnetic. Um, on this magazine, there is a magnet on the bottom. There's also a slot. I'm hoping you guys can see that right there. That slot has to index with the body of the rifle. Um, so you want to make sure you get that lined up right or the magazine won't go in. You should also know there is no stop on the bottom. So it is possible to take it out this way. It is also possible to load it from the right side. And you might ask, why? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to load from either side? This is actually a pretty big benefit. Um, let's say you had a big parallax wheel because you wanted to use the rifle for a field target or something like that. Um, being able to load it from the right side or the left side, and load, I mean, put the magazine in, um, it means that if you had a big parallax wheel, it would not be in the way of you loading the magazine in. Uh, so, kind of a nice touch uh, that way. I'm going to put a target card out at 30 yards, and we're going to shoot some groups. So, stay tuned. My action camera is bravely hanging out down on the 30 yard line. I have a target set up. Uh, the targets that we often use in reviews are splatter burst targets. Uh, they work really well and uh, nice and clear and easy to see where the hits are, which is nice. Um, I have a Element Optics Helix 4 to 16 um, on the air gun right now very clear picture so um, let's see what the XR200 can do basically two one whole groups so um, not bad at 30 what say we move everything out to 50 yards and see what she can do all right the target is set at 50 yards and let's see uh, my intention on the last one and you'll know by now but I don't remember if I did it exactly right but it's a 12 shot magazine so what I thought was going to shoot two six shot groups. Uh, that's what I'm going to try to do right now <laughs> and keep the counting in my mind as I'm shooting. You'll know if I get it right.
Okay, that was six. And shooting about one mil low. So we're shooting for groups, not for hitting any kind of bullseye, but uh, just to make it a little bit easier on myself, we're going to dial up and let's shoot six more. That last group's pretty nice. A uh, little bit of left to right. I've got a little bit of left to right breeze playing down range. I don't know, maybe you can see the movement in the umbrella here, but uh, that's not a bad group at 50. Um, question may come up. The gun can be decocked. I'm back from down range. Just picked up the target. Um, as I look here, first group at 30 yards is, well, I'm going to say it's a heavy half inch, probably just a little over a half inch. Second group is a little bit bigger than that, most likely three quarters of an inch, but uh, I'll put the first group up with some data points. And then I'll put the second group up with some data points. And then we went out to 50. Now I didn't dial the scope. I zoomed in just a little bit, but I didn't dial the scope. And I was aiming right here. Um, and you can see where those six shots fell. Um, not anybody's idea of an impressive 50 yard group. And so I dialed in, and that's at least an inch and a half, if not an inch and three quarters. Then I dialed a mil up. And the reason I did that, and hopefully this helps somebody, um, there's a difference between dialing, shooting, and holdover shooting. Um, I was doing neither when I shot this group. I was holding crosshairs and the pellets were falling. I was trying to hold exactly the same spot and the pellets were gonna fall wherever they were gonna fall. But after I shot the first shot, what I found myself doing was shifting my eyes immediately to where I thought it was gonna hit. And what I wasn't doing was good on the bench fundamental follow through. And one of the reasons why it's worth the money to buy a better scope that has better optical system um, and again, I'm using the, the Helix 4-16, to not a super long range scope, but good clear glass and very repeatable turrets. It's a scope I like quite a bit. Um, one of the reasons you, why it's worth it to invest in a better scope is if you can see your pellet going down range and you're shooting at the crosshairs that helps you practice the skill of following through on the shot, which avoids stuff happening. Um, you'll hear Springer shooters talking about lock time. Basically the amount of time it takes from the hammer falling to that pellet clearing the barrel. And as compared to a firearm, uh, pellet guns have very long lock time, so they're susceptible to poor follow through. And part of that is looking at the target long after you have stopped pulling the trigger because 
you've already broken the shot. So in the second group, and the reason that I think there's a difference between these two groups, um, and there is some wind downrange, um, but if you look at the difference in the horizontal, sorry, vertical dispersion, which is down to me really not shooting well, and here, that left to right, which is wind effect, um, that's how I at least account for the difference between these two groups. Um, this is going to be just a little over an inch, I would say between an inch and an inch and a quarter, but I will put an analysis of this group up and then I'll put a second one for this group which I really think is more the true accuracy potential for this rifle in 22 caliber. So my final thoughts on the Diana XR200 in 22 caliber. Um, I very much like the look of the rifle as traditional rifles go and the feel. I like that it has some spots where you can pretty easily put uh, a pick rail or whatever other kind of uh, mount that you want. Um, goes very easily under the forestock. Um, it's a comfortable rifle to shoulder. Remember that it has dovetail. Most of the scope rings that I have laying around are, um, <laughs> are Picatinny. So you'll need that UTG adapter if that's all you've got, kind of like me. Um, the trigger is between very nice and excellent. Um, and it can be further adjusted pretty easily by the end user and there's adequate documentation on how to do it um, in the manual. The power adjustment is by way of a transfer port. Um, I, do, I do wish you had access to hammer spring tension and maybe even a regulator adjustment um, as a sort of user serviceable uh, part. I think that's a, a better way to adjust your velocity um, than just kind of choking the air off because um, I think it gets you an opportunity or leaves you with an opportunity to both tune for accuracy but also um, use less air and probably tune into more shots per fill. Um, two magazines from the bench is not that big of a deal. If you're just plinking and having fun, it's not that big of a deal. Um, if you're out hunting in a high shooting environment, iguanas, uh, in some places squirrels, pigeons, um, it means you're going to have to stay relatively close to your air source uh, because you really only get two magazines uh, worth of shots before you have to refill. And the drop-off is pretty steep. Um, I wish on this transfer port adjustment uh, it was a little... Um, a little more repeatable and I wish there was some way to gauge other than counting turns how much you'd turned in or turned out. I said before I'm not really exactly sure how this particular transfer port works. I know how some of the other ones work. I think this one's actually working better than some of those other ones but I don't really understand it. So if somebody said hey can you take yours apart and do something to it and then put it back together um, for me, that would be an entire different tune on the gun because I'd have to go back to the beginning and just kind of work my way in one direction uh, because there's no like little guideline for it. Like there's no hashes or detents or anything like that. So if, I, if I'm being critical, which of course this is a review, so that's, that's what you guys um, expect. And even though this is a sponsored review by Diana, um, you're going to get the truth from me. Uh, so it works, and it gives you a fair uh, range um, for different types of pellets, but um, it's kind of one of those where you're probably going to tune it and then stick with it because you can't, you can't necessarily go back to exactly precisely where you were even just minutes ago once you make an adjustment. Um, ergonomically, 
for a traditional rifle, this is about as good as it gets. Um, the wood looks and feels great. The stippling is awesome. Uh, the cheek riser is super easy. Push button goes up, push button goes down. It's got a really big range of adjustment. Um, in fact, it, it goes so high, I can't imagine who would need it that high. Um, and then it goes all the way down, which is really, really low. And I don't know, um, I don't know who'd use that either. But you got great range of, of um, motion, tool free, and super easy to use. It's comfortable in the shoulder, next to no recoil. You've got a, an air gauge that isn't out here where you're looking down the barrel, which is pretty nice. Um, the cocking uh, stroke is a little bit rough. It would be nice if, I'll be happy if that smooths out over time. Um, and I love, I love the little shuttle uh, thing. I wish this was an option on like all of the rifle, traditional rifle air guns I owned. Uh, I just love that tick, 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 back and forth like playing ping pong kind of thing. It's got a very positive safety, um, easy to go back and forth. And um, if you go from fire to safe, you get that dry fire mode, kind of uh, you know practice your trigger control mode that is common on Olympic rifles. Uh, it's the first time I've seen it sort of on a non-competition gun. Um, and that's, that's kind of cool. Um, I guess really the, the big negative, and my guess is the aftermarket will take care of this, if not Diana directly, it's a fairly loud gun. It's not what I would consider backyard friendly at all. Um, I'm not certain that there's anything that's really a baffle inside the carbon fiber um, that's over the barrel. Uh, but my understanding is they have a, an adapter. And so the next time you see this rifle in my hands, expect that it will have a Donny FL on the end. Um, and we'll get, that, we'll get that noise level down to where I'm confident this rifle can be made uh, backyard friendly, which would really be a plus. Other than that, um, I'm hopeful that this cocking lever smooths out over time. Um, because it is, uh, I mean, you know if you didn't fully cock it, um, but it'd be nice if that were just a little bit, uh, a little bit smoother um, as, it, as it gets pulled back. Uh, my guess is, part of that is, it's a fairly heavy spring, um, and it's a fairly short throw. So you have to do a lot of mechanical work to compress that spring in a fairly short amount of time, um, and that usually leads to heavy cocking. I think that's it for this box to bench. Um, I hope you learned something about the rifle. And as always, if you have questions, please put them down below in the comments. I'll do my best to um, answer them. I have on fairly good authority that Pyramid Air has ordered some of these in. So, um, and of course they're not the only retailer that's gonna carry them, but. I do get asked the question like, when is it gonna be released? My understanding is right now you could buy this rifle today if you wanted to. Um, I'm not sure and it's not for me to talk about what MSRP or actual street price is. Uh, it's one of the things that, that most of the social media outlets don't really like you talking much about. Um, so you'll have to do that, that bit of research on your own. If it's something you're interested in, you can uh, you can reach out to your favorite retailer and see if they're bringing it in. Um, I think the uh, accuracy is good and I expect as I shoot it a little bit more that will only get better. So until the next video everyone, shoot safe, shoot straight, and we'll see you around.